your Bibles, Romans chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 7 in a little bit. Romans chapter 1, 1 through 7. Next week, we will commission out our core team to begin Jennings Creek Community Church. That'll be in both morning services next week. That's going to be a historic day in the life of Rich Palm Baptist Church. So in 2009, uh, we, we planted a Christ Fellowship Church, and they're replanting Forest Park Church today, and uh, we're planting Jennings Creek next week. So we'll commission them out uh, next week in both services, and then they will have a covenanting service over there at Jennings Creek Elementary School at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And we're all invited, want to be a part of that, participate in that. It's a historic day in the life of our church. And I especially love it that, um, that we're doing that just at our 50-year anniversary and uh, just seeing what uh, the Lord has done and how he's used this church and uh, really tremendous impact in an uh, important part of Bowling Green. Uh, I really want to be three churches now, Christ Fellowship, Jennings Creek, and Forest Park. So hope you'll be a part of that, be praying uh, for that new congregation. Maybe I should say those new congregations um, in these days. So I wanted you to know about that. I want you to be a part of that next week. Uh, and then today, today we receive communion. Uh, we do this regularly in this church. And by communion, we remember Christ and what he has done for us. The cost of our redemption. That our being brought to God was not easy was not uh, um, without cost it, it wasn't light it's a, it's a it's a big thing it's monumental because our sin ran deep the cure was costly and we remember Christ that he was willing to go to the cross and pay the debt of our sin to to die a cruel death to be crushed beneath the very wrath of God, the just penalty of God for your sin and mine. Jesus loved us enough to pay that price. And in the Lord's Supper, we, we remember him. We think about him. We are reminded of how loved we are, and we express our gratitude to him. This is, if, if you're in Christ, this is for you. The Lord's table is for sinners. Um, so if you're a sinner, you're welcome. If you don't think you are, then, then you're not welcome because that would be evidence that you have not yet repented. It is for sinners, but it is for repentant sinners, those who've become aware of their sin and have turned to Christ as their only hope. Um, and I would say repentant sinners who've experienced a new birth in Jesus Christ. And then I'll add a couple other provisions. One is you should not be participating in a breach of fellowship in this church unfaithfully. If, if that's you, you need to seek reconciliation with that brother or sister uh, before communion. So don't leave that, receive communion while, that, um, while your unfaithful participation in that breach is ongoing. Don't doesn't mean you have to be at peace with everybody. It means that you have to be faithful toward that, that breach of fellowship. And if you're not being, then you should deal with that first. The other thing is you shouldn't be in willful, deliberate, ongoing sin. I said the supper is for repentant sinners. And if, if, uh, if that's you, if you're in deliberate, willful sin, then you are not a repentant sinner. You're, <laughs> you're not. You may have repented one time in the past, but uh, that deliberate sin right now puts you in danger to take communion while you're in that state. So you need repentance, not communion, if that's you. Again, I'm not saying if you sin this morning, you can't do it. I'm talking about a willful, decided way of living. I know this is wrong. I'm doing it anyway. It's a completely different kind of category. And if that's you, we would call you to repentance, maybe repentance and then communion, but not communion while you're in that state or in that condition um, some of you under the sound of my voice aren't in christ yet you don't know him so you should let it pass when it comes by you 
but we're so glad that you're here. We want you in the room, and we want you thinking about this amazing love of a Savior who would pay that kind of price uh, to have sinners just like you. And maybe while others are receiving communion, you actually receive Jesus by repentance and faith. Uh, we would long for that to happen for, uh, for you. Um, but if you're his and you're walking with him, then you should receive it. You're not only permitted, you're encouraged. This is less the table of the Rich Palm Baptist Church and more, uh, more the Lord's table. Um, we begin our series in Romans this morning, and I think this uh, first greeting from Paul will serve us well on a communion Sunday. So Romans 1, 1 through 7. So let's stand and honor the reading of God's word. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Again, we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. We pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. You can take your seat. We're going to ask four questions of this greeting from Paul. And uh, as we ask the four questions, they're pretty basic elementary questions, but I think as we answer those from this text, it'll set the table really for this entire series. And I trust set the table for communion as well. The first thing is, first question, who is this letter from? Who is this letter from? It's pretty Obvious, isn't it? First word is the name Paul. But then he talks about who he is and describes it a little further three ways. So let's look at those. The first description is Paul, a servant of Christ, or some translations would say a slave of Christ, and it wouldn't be wrong to say that. Now, in the Old Testament, you had a phrase given to a few very, very crucial saints in the Old Testament, Abraham. Uh, Moses, uh, and the phrase was the servant of the Lord. Abraham, the servant of the Lord. Moses, the servant of the Lord. When you get to the book of Joshua, it begins by the Lord telling Joshua, uh, Joshua, Moses, the servant of the Lord, is dead. Moses, my servant, is dead. And he doesn't call Joshua the servant of the Lord. But when you get to chapter 24 at the end of the book, he finally calls him the servant of the Lord too. But this is a rare title in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, not so rare. Because all the blood-bought, born-again children of God are to be servants of Christ. We're all slaves of Christ. And then just notice that that servant of the Lord in the Old Testament is servant of Christ in the New Testament. So the Lord and Christ are the same. This is, this is a, a high doctrine of Christ here you get in the very first phrase. Now, before we move on, let me just ask you, can this be said of you? Would, would this characterize your life, that you're a slave of Christ, that you're a servant of the Lord? Or would it be a different characterization? Would it really be more like you are the captain of your own life, the master of your own fate, and whenever out of living that way, you get in a little bit of trouble, then you enlist Jesus to help you out. But he's not your master. He's occasionally your helper. That's not the way Christians to live. He's master. We're his servants. Then he says, called to be an apostle, called to be an apostle. An apostle meant literally one sent with a message, but when it uses the word apostle with reference to Paul or Peter or John or some others, then it is this special, unique office 
that did not, did not, wasn't passed on past the first century. Uh, and they were uh, those who Christ had chosen witness the resurrection and were to propagate the gospel, advance the gospel in the world in the first century after Jesus died and rose again. He's called to be an apostle. And then really the next phrase will give you some sense of what uh, apostolic ministry would look like set apart for the gospel of God. Set apart for the gospel of God. And if you remember what happened with Paul, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He uh, hated the church. He was persecuting it. He was trying to destroy it. He was on the way to Damascus and he was going to arrest the believers, maybe even execute the believers. And on the way, this light from heaven shone and the Lord spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And it's as if Jesus reached down among that group of Pharisees and he plucked one of them out and he set him apart for the sake of the gospel. And if you read the epistles and you read the book of Acts, you see that's clearly the way Paul lived his life, set apart for the sake of the gospel. And before we move on, I would just want to ask you, is your life set apart for the sake of the gospel? You might say, well, his calling is unique and special. And there's a sense in which that's true. I wouldn't claim uh, apostolic office for myself or any of us or anybody living today. But does that really mean that we're not set apart for the gospel? Does it really mean that our life is not to be of use for the advance of the gospel in this world? I would argue that it is. It is. So it's from Paul, servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Second question, who is the letter to? Who's the letter to? We've got to jump to the end of the text to get that. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 6. Including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. So who's the letter to? It's to the saints in Rome. It doesn't say to the church at Rome or in Rome, like it might say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 or 2 Corinthians chapter 1, to the church at Corinth. It doesn't say that, I think, largely because I think there were churches in Rome. And if you read chapter 16 carefully, you get a sense of that, that there's a house church in uh, Priscilla and Aquila's home, and there were other house churches. So there were a number of churches. He's writing to the saints all of them. And then they're characterized three ways as well. First, called to belong to Jesus Christ. That's quite a calling, isn't it? Did you know that if you're in Christ, you don't really own your own life? You are owned. You are possessed. And really, if you're in Christ, you're owned two ways. You're owned because he made you. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So you belong to him by creation, but even more importantly, you belong to him by redemption, by redemption. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. So you belong to Jesus Christ. You are his. And that's a high calling. And then the second thing he says is they're loved by God. They're loved by God. And if we get anything from a communion service, it ought to be that, shouldn't it? That we are absolutely loved by this God. This Father, who, as he will say later to us in late Romans chapter 8, who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all. Or the way it's demonstrated in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you have a sense of how loved you are? That God wouldn't spare his son but gave him up for you? That Jesus loved you so much that he would lay down his life for you? To bring you to God, to bring you to himself? You're so dearly loved. Belonging to Jesus Christ, loved by God, and then called to be saints, to be saints. And that's very similar to Paul saying, set apart A saint is a holy one, set apart from the world, set apart from those that don't know Christ for a holy life. They're saints. Saint is not a kind of a special, unique category that only a few achieve in the scriptures. Everyone who is born of the Spirit, washed in the blood, has a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Everyone who's experienced that is a saint. You have been set apart to God 
for the gospel. You are a saint. Now, before we move on to the third question, did you notice that the word called is in here three times? In here, verse 1, about the apostle Paul called to be an apostle. And then you had it twice about the saints at Rome, called to belong to Jesus Christ in verse 6 and called to be saints in verse 7. Now, when we hear the word called, we tend to hear, we have a tendency to hear a general call. Jesus calls everybody, every man, woman, boy, and girl to himself. Everybody's called among every people, nation, tribe, and tongue, young, old, rich, poor, everybody's called. And in scripture, sometimes that's what it means. But I don't think that's what it means here. In fact, I would argue, I want you to think with me, it can't mean that here. Otherwise, the letter would be written to everyone. If it's a general call to every person, then called to be saints makes no distinction. It doesn't narrow the field at all. The, Ro the, the book of Romans is, is, is written to everybody. Called to belong to Jesus Christ, called to be saints, called to be an apostle. This is what the old preachers would call effectual calling or an effective call. And when Jesus calls you this way, you will come. Called Paul that way on the way to Damascus. It's out of the blue. Paul wasn't looking for him. Jesus was looking for Paul. And he found him. He sought him. And he brought him. Now, I don't, I don't want to tie you in a theological knot here. But I just want you to chew on that. If, you, if, you're, if your heart's resisting me a little bit, you might just jump ahead to Romans chapter 8 where he says, those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. He didn't leave any uh, sort of exceptions to that. Everybody called, got justified. Everybody justified, got glorified. So you can read sort of that chain there in Romans 8. But what I would encourage you to do on on a Sunday where we take communion, it just realize and let your heart be full of gratitude that you're saved less because of your choice and more because of God's. That he loved you and in mercy and grace he looked your way. And he saved you. So this is not a 50-50 proposition. It's all of grace. And that's something that, that word, what that word called means. Third question, third question, what is the letter for? What is the letter for? We're going to back up a little bit just before what we're, where we just were and, and look at verse 5. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including, including you who are called. We receive grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. That's, that, that's what this letter is is for to bring about the obedience of faith among the nations. Now, what's the obedience of faith? What does that mean? And really, it, there's a couple of things it can mean, maybe more than two, but two kind of primary ones. One is it would be the obedience that is faith, the obedience which is faith. So, uh, obedient response to the gospel. So when you repented of your sins and you placed personal faith in Jesus Christ, you were obeying the gospel. And so obedience of faith could mean obedience to the gospel. I repent of my sins and I trust in Jesus. I decide to follow him. It's obedience of faith. It also could mean the obedience that springs from faith. That when you have real, genuine, saving faith, that faith will show itself in obedience. And if there's no trajectory of obedience in your life, then there's reason for you to doubt, am I, am I really, do I really know Jesus at all? If there's no obedience there, no fruit of the gospel being worked out, then it's wise and right to question, is the root of the gospel in me? Now I would argue that when the Apostle Paul is a little bit vague, he's intentionally vague. And I think what we're supposed to do is take it both ways. And I think the letter is evangelistic in purpose. He does want people to respond in obedience to the gospel. And I don't know of a clear unpacking of the gospel and a more comprehensive unpacking of the gospel anywhere in the scripture than you, what you have in Romans. 
and I'm delighted to try to bring it to you in, in the next uh, several months. I don't think it will be uh, several years, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see, but, uh, but several months, definitely. And um, so I'm excited about that, and I hope that as we go through it together, the Lord saves people. The people respond in the obedience of faith to the gospel, that they obey the command to repent and trust in Christ for salvation. Um, but it's also the obedience that springs from faith. Otherwise, who's he writing to? He's writing to the saints in Rome. He's not writing to lost people. He's writing to save people. And he's wanting them to obey the gospel in this obedience of faith, this obedience that springs from the gospel. That's something of what the obedience of faith is. And there's a sense in which generally that's God's purpose in the world to bring about the obedience of faith. That's God's purpose for us as we seek to bring others that through our efforts advancing the gospel, sharing the gospel, he would bring about the obedience of faith uh, among those that don't know Christ. That's, that's, that's certainly what God's about in the world. That's what he's about through his people and always has been. And it's also among the nations that he's purposing to bring about the obedience of faith. It's one of the great joys we have right now in Bowling Green is the nations are coming to us. And they really are. I, 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 I did gospel to every home yesterday morning. So uh, James and I were knocking on doors in apartment buildings over there in the water park area. And I met a fellow from Somalia. And I met several from the Congo. And I met a woman from Myanmar, and I, and I met, oh, what was the other one? I, I met a Thai woman, a woman from Thailand. And I met a couple of other people. We met a couple of other people that I'm pretty sure were some, from some other places, but they didn't know enough English to be able to tell us where they were from, or we couldn't understand what they were saying. But I, I know at least four, and I expect a half a dozen different nations, not European descended, but from other places. And this gospel opportunity is huge and beautiful. It's what God is about in, in the world and what he's about through his people, what he's about through the Apostle Paul, what he's about through us. But also in a very specific way, this letter is to the Romans to bring about the obedience of faith in their lives. What would that mean? Well, as we work through the book, we're going to see a couple of things. We're going to see that, that, um, uh, that there was some potential for division among the Romans and it was among ethnic lines and cultural lines that there were some Jews in the Roman church and there were a lot of Gentiles in the Roman church and they didn't always see eye to eye on everything. And they were struggling with that. When we get over to chapter 14 and 15, we're going to see how Paul calls them to the obedience of faith in relationship to that potential breach. Therefore, welcome one another as God in Christ has welcomed you to the glory of God. I think that's 15 verse Seven, but I might be off a little bit. And so he's going to call them to that obedience. And toward the end of the book, he's going to talk about his desire to go to Spain with the gospel because everywhere around here, the gospel has already been presented, at least in the major cities. And from those major cities where churches are planted, it's going to go out to the countryside. But I want to go to Spain where nobody's ever heard about Jesus. And he wants them to, to respond to that need for the gospel to advance around the world with the obedience of faith and to join him in that mission. And I just got to say, as we begin Romans, that these are a couple of my hopes for us as a church, that God would produce the obedience of faith in us and among us, that our church and our unity, our love for one another, uh, it would be a gospel culture that's shaped by the gospel and that our love for each other says something about God's love for us, the way we're kind to each other, the way we forgive one another, the way we're patient with each other, uh, that we're quick confessors and quick repenters and quick forgivers because we love one another, because Christ has loved us, that our life together is that culture is increasingly more shaped by this gospel. And then our heart for the gospel to advance among the nations in our community and state and nation and in the very world, that, that, that the, our missionary hearts are uh, set ablaze for the nations. That's my hope. That's what this letter is for. That God would produce in the Romans uh, this 
hearts knit together by that gospel. So before we go any further, we're going to say our church covenant together. That's our practice here. Just remind ourselves of the promises we make in church membership. If you're not a member, you don't have to say this. You can say as much as conscience will permit, so you're welcome. But certainly, we're not asking you to do that. But the rest of us who've made these promises, let's restate them. So stand with me and let's renew them. Having been, as we trust, brought by divine grace to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and to give up ourselves wholly to him, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now solemnly and joyfully covenant with each other to walk together in him with brotherly love to his glory as our common Lord. We do therefore depend on the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines. We will contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also strive to maintain family and private devotions, to religiously educate and shepherd our children, to walk carefully and diligently in the world so that the souls of our kindred and acquaintances may be saved. We will also endeavor to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our conduct. Furthermore, we agree to abstain from any practice that brings unwarranted harm to the body or damages our own or another's faith. We further commit to watch over one another in meekness and brotherly love, to remember one another in prayer, and to aid one another in sickness and distress. We will be slow to take offense, but always eager for reconciliation, and mindful that we are committed to walk in the newness of life according to the scriptures. We also agree that if we leave from this place, we will, as soon as possible, Unite with some other church where we can carry out the principles of God's Word. All right, you can take your seat. And now to the fourth question. It said, what is this letter for? Now, what is this letter about? And we go back to verse 2 where we dropped off with the first question. Set apart for the gospel of God. Romans is about the gospel. And Paul, first of all, describes it as the gospel of God. That means it's... Uh, the gospel that God devised in his great love and great wisdom, a way that he could recover sinners like us to himself, lost and ruined by the fall, and yet recovered through his son. It's also the gospel of God because he is, uh, the, he, he is the greatest gift of the gospel. A lot of times people think of the gospel as the means to the end. The gospel is the way I get to heaven and I don't have to go to hell. And that is true, but that's to say only that is not to say enough about the gospel. The gospel is to bring you to God. It's for you to be recovered to the one who made you. That's what it's for. And the best gift is you get to know him and be in relationship with him. And not just for this life, but for all eternity. The gospel of God. And then what is the gospel about which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. So it didn't come to us out of a vacuum, but God planned it long ago. Jesus is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The prophets promised it. God knew it was coming because he planned for it to come and put it in the mouths of his prophets. And then verse 3, concerning his son. It's the gospel of God, but the gospel is about Jesus. And look what he says here, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. He says two basic things about Jesus here. According to the flesh, he's descended from David, so he's son of David, but declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. Now you've got a contrast here in the life of Jesus. There's the weakness as we sing sometimes, robed in frail humanity. And then there's the resurrection strength when he's raised from the grave. Now, you might look at that and say, declared to be the son of God. And you might think, did Jesus just become the son of God when he rose from the grave? Is that what Paul is saying? No, 
You need that little prepositional phrase on the end of it. Declared to be the Son of God in power. <laughs> he was declared to be the Son of God before the resurrection, but not in power. The Son of God, in many ways, in weakness, so that he'd go to the cross and die for our sins. And then at the resurrection, declared to be the Son of God in power. Are you tracking with me? That's, it's important that you get that. And the word here, if you're reading CSV or NIV, it'll say appointed rather than declared. Probably a better translation there. So Jesus Christ, the, the gospel is about Jesus who went to the cross and died for us. His resurrection is from the dead. And that death he died paid the penalty for our sin. When he died, he bore all our sin, our guilt, our shame. He bore in his body the very penalty for our sin when he died on the cross. He was crushed beneath the wrath of God for our sin. He died for us. He died in our place. And as we take bread and we take the fruit of the vine, we remember that body given and broken and that blood spilled. He died, he didn't just appear to be dead, he died and fully paid the penalty for our sin in his body on the tree. He was buried and on the third day he rose again. And because of that, we have a living savior who brings life to us. So deacons, you all come forward now. The scripture says the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and gave thanks for it. He said, this is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And so we're gonna go to the Lord now and give thanks for his body given and broken for us on the cross. Craig Givens will word that prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you through your son, Jesus Christ today. And we remember over 2,000 years ago what you did for us. You paid for the sins that we've committed this week, and we will commit next week and forevermore in our lives. I pray that you'd uh, give us the ability to grasp that, that level of love and kindness that you showed for us. And, Father, as we leave this place today, I pray that you would uh, enable us to share that same grace with those around us. Father, we thank you for the body of Christ that changed the world forevermore. Amen.
This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you take it in remembrance of me. And so we'll have a prayer expressing our gratitude for the blood of Christ that was spilled for us on the cross. And Larry Massey will word that prayer. Our dear gracious and heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for sending your son so many years ago to live the perfect life and, and die on the cross to cover our sins, dear Father. In Christ's name, amen. Let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin the double pure, save from the labors of my hands can fulfill thy lost demands could my zeal no respite know could my tears forever flow all for sin could not atone thou must say Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me safe. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages left for me, let me hide in thee, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee.
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do in remembrance of me. Now, when I was preaching about the purpose of this letter, I gave you the, the basic purpose, which is to bring about the obedience of faith to the Romans, uh, responding to repentance and faith and responding with a, with a life of obedience that springs from the gospel and their unity, their love for each other and the advance of the gospel and all of that to all the nations. But there is an ultimate purpose and the ultimate purpose is for the sake of his name among the nations. We have a tendency to be really sort of man-centered in the way we think about things, but the Bible is not like that. It's God-centered. He gets glory in the rescue of sinners. So the ultimate purpose of Romans is for the sake of his name, the glory of God in the obedience of faith among his people, among all the nations. So we're going to give glory to our God and our Christ right now as we sing and worship him and give him praise. Let's stand and